Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and some good evenings of some people. Today was very uh, honored to have people from all over the world. First of all, I thank you very much for spending the time with us today. Uh, we welcome you to our special webinar. So today we are very excited to hear, to share with you about how slowing the onset and progression of diabetic kidney disease, so-called DKD, okay? Actually today, first of all, we encourage everybody to ask a lot of questions and we will be able to answer you at the end of the session. Now, let me introduce myself first. I'm Andrew Lau. I am a president of CTT of MWA Form. Uh, we are, I'm the creator of Lo Shu Ti. Uh, I was an ICU nurse and have 40 years of medical and healthcare experience. I was the former vice president of Baxter Asia Pacific and retired from Abbott Laboratory as a regional director. I introduced IV catheters and CAPD dialysis therapy through our Asia Pacific and saved many lives. So I know dialysis very well. I also know diabetic very well because I took care of many, many patients. And uh, joining here today is so wonderful. We have Corey Corino who is Corey's a multimedia celebrities. I mean, we're so honored to have her because she is a very famous person in the Philippines. On top of that, she's the former Philippine president, uh, uh, Carino, 1940, 1953. Very famous people. On top of that, she is a healthcare educator, author of many best-selling books for every young, for example. She also featured many beauty and healthy tips for, uh, for her work program. She's a council member of Philippine Red Cross and support various humanitarian activities. So I'm so honored to have Corey be part of the participation as the uh, co-host speakers. And she's gonna ask uh, Larry some uh, very good questions actually. So start us off. Uh, joining us also with Professor Larry Chan. Very famous uh, professor. Uh, he is a pre professor of medicine of nephrology and surgery of the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He's also a member of Transplant Center of University of Colorado Hospital. Dr. Chen specialized in a pre uh, application of MNR and other molecular biomaker in all graphs uh, rejection. His medical research focused on effort at different immunosuppression drugs on cellular metabol uh, metabolism, and he worked uh, in renal transplantation, chronic renal failure, and hypertension. So this is truly a renowned, very qualified person to tell you about DKD. Uh, uh, D. It's so great to have Larry to help us to explain. Um, let me just summarize very quickly what we're trying to do objectively today. We're trying to understand the cause and early signs and symptoms of diabetic kidney disease, DKD. Uh, so we have to know, underline what is the mechanism, develop DKD, and explore new treatment option and prevention, and also learn the tip how to slow down the onset and progressions on DKD. And that's so important because with knowing that at least you can prevent you to really end up with dialysis, that is so good to have that, right? So I hope that everybody have a chance to really learn more. And so uh, we can able to really prevent uh, uh, DKD and get a better health. And we're the maker of low shoe tea, which help pre-diabetic uh, and diabetes patients to maintain better blood sugar level. Uh, we have shown many clients uh, able to postpone at their pre-diabetic conversion and delay the onset of diabetic complication. Uh, it does actually have patient study showing lower the blood sugar plus also lower uh, the LDL, bad cholesterol, blood pressure, and detox. And plus, we have five programs, including diet, exercise, weight control, blood tracking, and all the education that help you, uh, including the weekly webinar we have, uh, which Loshutic uh, user can greater awareness with their own health and prevent diabetic complication. And we kind of hold the hands, so to speak, throughout the diabetic journey to maintain better health. So we also create a poll question. Uh, and uh, you can see that on the button of your uh, screen has a poll. So you click on it and we'll run a very quick poll uh, just to get a bit of understanding the type of people we are li uh, listening and so forth. And so that way uh, we will give you back some of the answer at the end of the day and see what the people have. So while you're doing the poll questioning, uh, without further uh, delay, uh, we will jump right into the panel discussion. 
So I will ask uh, Corey to join me uh, on this uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, Corey, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Good morning, gonna Andrew. You yeah, thank you. Hello. And thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here with the distinguished presence of Dr. Larry Chen and with you, Andrew, for discovering and developing Nosu tea. In this way, we can make everyone healthy. Absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, Corey, I understand you have some question to ask uh, Professor Chen. Maybe you can uh, uh, take this time to ask Professor Chen. Okay. My my questions are all lifestyle related. Okay, good. Because a lot of people go through their daily lives now that there's no more uh, risk of uh, COVID, well, hardly any risk of COVID. People are going out, no more social distancing and they forget to wear their masks. And so <laughs> right. we, we remain vulnerable, right? Always, right. yeah, every yeah. single Absolutely. minute of our lives, we are exposed to microbes, bacteria, viruses. My question is, uh, some doctors that I've interviewed during this pandemic have already said it, that the one who are most vulnerable to uh, being victimized by COVID-19 are those who have diabetes. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Larry. Yeah, well, that's definitely true because diabetes is a uh, multi organs uh, disease, not just high blood sugar. And all those patients with diabetes will have uh, immune, relatively immune compromised. So they are more susceptible to infections. And also once they got the infection, they are more and more frail and easily get sicker than rest of the population because they might have high blood pressure, uh, their heart may not be doing that well, they might have uh, infection in other area. So taking this together, their mortality rate, uh, in addition to being highly susceptible to infection, uh, especially COVID, their complication rate is also high. And again, the mortality rate is also high among this patient. And diabetes being uh, so widely, you can say high prevalence in the community. That means you hear about that so often. And a lot of people might have diabetes and they didn't know they have that and they get the disease. And so they have those complications. So taking all this together, it is an important, uh, issue to appreciate and it's an important problem for us to have education to make uh, people to be aware of that so like any health issue it's both individual the patient but it's also the community the community and the society to help to uh, prevent the disease and take care of those patients Matter of fact, uh, just to update in Hong Kong, quite a number of people who are diabetes got COVID and died and they're older folks too. So it's yeah. really sad. And, and, and matter of fact, in the early days, majority of people with death uh, are actually diabetic related also, just to keep you updated. So it's really uh, something that you yeah. don't want to be in that boat, you know? So, so these are all what we call risk factors risk factor of the disease, risk factor of the individual or their age, and also the risk factor, how well they control the disease. Mm. If they didn't control their disease well, that means they are more susceptible to complication. And in addition to all the cardiovascular disease, other complication is infection and susceptible to uh, the epidemic as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Larry, you said that a lot of people, and I quote from uh, your reply, a lot of people don't know that they have diabetes. What are the warning signs? For most well, well, I think it's a worldwide problem, worldwide problem. And prevalence or instance or whatever you call it is a commonly disease, which it's not necessarily called acquire. Some of them may be because of your genetic, your background, your family 
but the majority of the cause is because of your lifestyle, uh, your behavior, your overweight, your habit of eating. So they are eventually develop what we call metabolic syndrome and then diabetes. So there's really a silent epidemic, what we call it now, the epidemic world is so uh, well aware of. But this is a silent epidemic, which means that a lot of people may have the disease and they didn't know that unless they go and check it. And depending on what test they do, of course they check their blood sugar, but depending on when they check their blood sugar, and of course now we have the A1C, which give you an average. But more than that, it's possible that a lot of people, before they go to check it, they may have high blood sugar for a long time without symptoms. Because normally you don't have symptoms. You may have increase in frequency of urination, a little bit thirsty, more drink more water. But this a little bit later, but early on, we don't know. So. In fact, if you can say average patient when they come to a doctor and to say uh, health checkup and they found to have what we call either diabetes or pre-diabetic. And this is based on their lab test, their urine, their blood test. But before that, it's possible for many years they already harboring the disease without knowing it. So this is something that we need to have what you are doing, which is perfect is education, generate more public awareness so that we can have prevention. By the time they have the disease, the prevention may be a little late. So the prevention started should be before they have the disease. And then the complication of diabetes, heart problem, high blood pressure, and of course what we're going to talk about is diabetic kidney disease. Uh, it occur after they have diabetes. And again, they are also silent. A lot of individuals didn't know they have diabetic kidney disease. And actually they might have that many years before that. So exactly the same as uh, diabetes per se. When they diagnose they have diabetes, they probably might have the disease three, four or five years before that. And weight is a good index. You can take it this way because diabetes, you have type one, type two. Type one is a juvenile onset, which is difficult to prevent because a lot of them is because uh, of the early onset, uh, uh, many factors that lead to the uh, insulin cell of the pancreas fail, so they don't have enough insulin. But the majority of diabetes, what we talk about nowadays about the silent epidemic, is type 2 diabetes, which usually at our onset. Uh, in the past, usually is after 40 years old. But now we are seeing more and more patients develop this type 2 diabetes before they are 40 years old. And that's why we have so many patients with diabetes nowadays that uh, we didn't know that is when we diagnosed it. But in fact, there's another silent, not necessarily majority, but a silent proportion of population might have the disease, pre-diabetic or diabetic, without knowing it. Okay, Do Dr. Larry, one last question, because I know we have to go into the main part of the seminar, actually, but uh, can you reverse diabetes? Reverse? Well, okay, it's, uh, it's depending on what's the time scale you want to reverse it. You want to reverse an individual? or you want to reverse, look at the public health thinking, society thinking. Society, public health, yes, it's possible because now we have 12 to 15% of the population have uh, diabetes worldwide, vary from society to society, and depending on how diligent you look at that. Can we reverse this trend? Yes, we can, provided we work together, take action. So how many action we have to take? Mm -hmm. Well, individual is one, of course, that's important, but it's so difficult. Once you have the disease, it will be very difficult to reverse it. But you can prevent the complication. You can prevent the organ that got affected get worse. So it slow down the progression, slow down the disease process, less complication so that the individual, the patient can live longer. So even they have diabetes, if they are well taken care of, 
by the patient itself, by the family, by the doctors, by the healthcare system, so that they don't have to worry, there's no money to buy the medicine, uh, there's no money to do a lot of things, then they can live a long life. They can live to 80 years old, 90 years old. Okay, so in that case, can we say we're reversing it? Well, we're slowing down the process. We're not actually reverse the diabetes itself, but we'll reverse the complication or prevent the complication. In that case, we can say we can reverse. But I'm talking about more than just individual. Now we talk about community, society. And that's a more challenging problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to be positive. We have to say, yes, we can. We can reverse it. Yes, we can. Yes, <laughs> yeah, we can. Then, then we have to start from individual, community, society. Society is just not necessarily the city, the, the village, the but also government. professional society, voluntary society, institute, organization like uh, Corey, what you are doing in your community or worldwide, what Andrew is doing, public education. And then we need to develop a good system a system of integrated public versus private partnership. Mm. And then hopefully we can change the public policy, which is also important. Public policy, we deal with government now, right? Mm -hmm. So from non-government organization, uh, countrywide to worldwide or United Nations, to individual countries, public health policy, public care policy, hospital practice, pharmacy. And of course, don't forget about the other area, which is we need to understand the disease more. How do we understand? We need to do more research, mm. both basic research as well as applied research, both in the university as well as in the community. We need big data, collect all the information. Now we are in a position to be available to have all the data integrated together. So public health is important. Governmental involvement is important. Society involvement is important. And of course, individual. Individual require a good education program. And Corey, what you are doing is will be recommended because it's by doing that one patient at a time, one individual at a time, so that we can build a community for healthcare, for prevention. Yes, okay, and one more thing, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Larry, what is the one thing, all our friends who are watching us right now, what is yeah. the one thing that we can do right now, any lifestyle change right now that can prevent diabetes? Well, uh, start early early start that's important you don't have diabetes yet yeah then eventually you will get older and if you keep doing what you are doing without watching your diet if you just stay around watching uh television don't do your enough exercise eventually you'll get diabetes so watch out about what you are doing now if you are getting close to you may develop that, then you want to prevent it by watching your diet, do exercise, be aware of what you are doing. And you can say communication, education, that's the other thing. And if you have that, then find out what are the culprits, the risk factor, minimize them, minimize them. Mm -hmm. So if blood sugar is high, then minimize the blood sugar. If blood pressure is not as adequate, control, Make sure you seek appropriate advice. Keep your blood pressure under better control. Well, when you get old, invariably, you're going to have a cholesterol problem. And what is the right level of cholesterol? Again, it keep changing. The mark always keep changing. It used to be at that level is okay. But five or 10 years later, no, no, it's no. You need to have it lower. <laughs> and used to think that, oh, you only have to worry about cholesterol when you are 50. No, when you are 40, you have to think about that. And if you are elevated, then you better watch out your diet. And if you still can't control that, then there's medicine available for that. So all this added together is education, education, public awareness. 
So you're saying then that diabetes or having diabetes is not really a death sentence. We can we can improve the quality of our life and extend our life. Yeah, definitely we can. And since later on we're going to talk about diabetes, and again I'm going to stress another point. Invariably, diabetic patients eventually may have some kidney disease, mm -hmm. and it's a matter of time. What you want is that you want to extend that as long as possible. And even if you have diabetic kidney disease, doesn't mean that it will go downhill all the way. You want to change the slope from getting your kidney disease problem in five years, you want to extend it to 10, 20, or even 30 years. When you are 80 or 90 years old, maybe you are less worried. We want to find that there are various methods from lifestyle changes to diet to the right kind of medicine, the right kind of advice, avoid uh, risk, toxic substance that worsening the kidney function. And of course, is to preserve whatever kidney function they have to avoid replacing it. So this is a, a Logan that I have going to put it down later in the talk. It's preserving what you have, mm. all right? Instead of replacing yeah. it. And that's the key thing. Of course, we have so many patients on dialysis and it's okay when they're on dialysis. If they do it well, they can still live a reasonable good life and extend uh, uh, their uh, productivity 10, 20, or even 30 years. And in this country, in US, we have uh, half a million individual on dialysis or transplant. Around the world is probably working time by three or four, so about two million uh, uh, individual on dialysis. And if you've uh, expanded, how many people are with kidney disease that eventually leading it? they will be a number of millions and more than half of them are due to diabetes. Mm. We want to make sure that the number doesn't continue to rise as quick as what we have in the last 30 years. We want to make sure a lot of patients, they may be heading that way, but we're going to preserve whatever small amount of kidney function they have not getting worse so that they will not need any dialysis down the road. So preserving the kidney function they have and prevent them from needing dialysis. And this is my uh, message. Thank you so much, Dr. Larry. Okay. Andrew, back to you. <laughs> oh, good. Well, you know, this is very, very good questions. On top of that, I learned a lot. On top of that will be the insight. Larry talk about the, you know, public health and government, everybody together. What's so important is really individual really required to work on it and take effort. And so we won't get into that boat. It also could be really, like you said, we can just delay the progression, live longer, some kind of so-called uh, uh, reverse it to diabetes, so to speak. But I have a patient which is really uh, 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 come to see me, uh, you know, since last year October, and he's really looking forward to hear your insight. Uh, she is a 68 years old patient, which is Mrs. Wong, and has diabetic for over 15 years. And as uh, her age uh, at 53, she found out that she had high cholesterol, high blood pressure. The blood pressure went up to 160, 180. Diastolic was 90 over 100. And very quickly, the doctor also said, hey, you have early state of diabetes. But on the hand, you know, she doesn't have any symptom. Really, at the end of the day, she don't feel sick. For eight years, she was saying that, hey, you know, I feel pretty good. I, I Although I do have high blood pressure, cholesterol, but she is continue to enjoy her lifestyle, going to eat whatever, travel with friends. And on the hand, with that, though, good lifestyle, her BM. Uh, BMI actually increased to 30, so she got, gained a lot of weight, okay? And uh, at age 65, the doctor said, hey, you're diabetic, getting worse. So even though you're taking metformin, you know, uh, 2,000 milligrams per day, uh, 1,000 per tap, uh, one in the morning, one at night, her blood sugar was uh, A1C go over 10 to 11% already. And she, doctor said, hey, look, you know, 
your blood pressure is still high, 150 over 90, cholesterol, LDL is still 3.8. The doctor said, we've got to put your insulin. But she said, wow, I can't have gotten insulin, you know, taking a shot. Are you kidding? You know, is she really afraid needle? So mm -hmm. last October, she came to see me. And basically, we start her on uh, low shoe tea. But at that time, her GFR, which is the glomerular filtration, you know, uh, 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 item that is measure her uh, kidney function, only got 40%. And the doctor said, you know, you, you get 30%, you require dialysis. And she was scared. That's why she came to see us. And suddenly, we let her uh, try low shoe tea, but she still continued taking her three drugs, which is uh, Novak uh, and also Losantin, both are uh, blood pressure pills. And she also taking Lipitor, which is the cholesterol pills, 20 milligram. And she also continued to take metformin, two, 1000 milligram, two times a day. And she started drinking a little shoe tea. But fortunately, because of that, we got her to control her diet, exercise, rate control. Her BMI actually came down to 28. She lost some weight. Plus, she bought an Abbott Libby continued tracking her blood sugar. So her daily blood sugar becomes seven uh, minimal per liter or 126 milligram per deal. Her A1C dropped down below 7% versus previously was 10 plus percent. Huh? So, and her blood pressure are uh, fairly controlled now, 130, uh, 140 around there, and diastolic is still about 90. And she really wanted to talk to Dr. Chan, is wondering, okay, and now I, I'm on a GFR 40. Her condition would it continue to progress to be worse? And since her blood sugar has improved, and she would like to hear uh, Professor Chen insight, basically. Well, thank you, Angel. I think this is a wonderful uh, case uh, example to illustrate the various issues that confronting a patient with diabetes. And Mrs. Wong, we have to congratulate you for. You are a wonderful patient because you are taking good care of yourself. But looking at the uh, spectrum of the history, uh, when you were diagnosed to have a mild diabetes, high blood pressure and cholesterol, uh, what we normally will label that as called metabolic syndrome. Okay, when you're 53 years old, if you have high blood pressure and depending on your weight, but for Asian, the uh, weight may be different from what the Western thinking of the weight. But most of us, uh, uh, the BMI may not be exactly the same, but you might be already slightly on the high side of the weight. And even when you are 53, uh, the blood sugar might be high, but was not that high. But it's possible you might have prediabetes or diabetes many years before that. And it's possible when you're 45 or 40, you are doing well, everything is fine, you didn't really check your blood or anything, but it's very likely you might have what we call insulin resistant. Your body still secretes insulin, but your tissues uh, doesn't really react to well your insulin. So in a good example is inflation. Okay, you have the same amount of money, but you didn't buy enough uh, stuff now. Okay, so you already have inflation <laughs> before you're 53 regarding insulin uh, currency. So you were, uh, you were taken care of very well by your doctor, but we don't know in between 53 to 65, how frequent was your checkup? I'm sure your kidney function was normal during that time, but kidney function is a very loose term, depending on how they test your blood. If you just check the common parameter called creatinine, then you may not see any changes. And if they, uh, uh, use a special formula to calculate to creatinine to what we call GFR, stand for glomerular filtration rate, a very high sounding rate, but basically very simple. When your creatinine is less than one, it is all called 100%. When your creatinine is two, this is what I taught medical students, it's 50%. And when you jump to four, it's 25%. 
So between age of 53 to 65, eight years, uh, there was no information, but I believe the, the GFR might slowly decreasing without you noting it because creatinine won't show any change at that time. The other interesting parameter people uh, need to be aware of is that need to check urine for albumin. Mm. And most of the uh, community now doesn't really aware of that. That is important parameter to check if you have diabetes. Once you have diabetes, at some stage, every other year or annual checkout, need to look for albumin in the urine. If there's higher than normal albumin in your urine, that means your kidney started to have some damage already. So when you are 60, uh, 53 to 65, eight years, you already noticed to have high cholesterol, high blood pressure. So you are given appropriate medication for blood pressure. But I haven't had the good uh, readout of different blood pressure at different time. Uh, and there are some blood pressure medicine better than the other. So they were up to individual doctor who choose it. But there are some blood pressure medicine may have some pro renal protective effect. They try to make sure, just like, engine oil for the car. So car will be a good analogy. You have a car at uh, 40 years old or 53 or so, and you run, everything seems okay, but you didn't know there's something problem because you didn't maintain it well. You didn't give good enough uh, engine oil. And by when you are, so eight years later, when you go and check out, found out, oh, there's one or two other problem, but it's fixable, so you fix it. So blood pressure, cholesterol are elevation, and blood sugar was not well controlled because A1C was very high. And it's probably not well controlled for several years. And it's not good because if you control it well, maybe your kidney will preserve better function. But no worry because they are uh, taking good care of you and you are taking good care of yourself. So you are starting on metformin, which is again a good drug to be given for people with diabetes, the first line of drug to give, especially when your kidney function was still okay, uh, because metformin is uh, excreted by the kidney. So when your kidney function started to deteriorate, your amount of metformin taken need to be adjusted as well, okay? But anyway, you are on that, but look as if by itself, the blood sugar is not well controlled, so you uh, rely yourself, self-care, uh, changing lifestyle, uh, watch out your diet and blood sugar, and then when you are on uh, three years later, 68, the function seemed to deteriorate in terms of the kidney, but how bad is that? It all depends. If you are really not well controlled, your blood sugar maybe you are much worse. Your control may be a little better, then it will preserve the kidney function. So this is where you are. So the more you control your blood sugar, the more you control your um, uh, blood pressure and watch out your activity, diet, uh, various things. Hopefully, you will preserve that kidney function for many, many more years to come and avoid dialysis. So congratulate for taking good care of yourself. Wow, that is a very, very good uh, tips for Mrs. Wong. She will be really greatly appreciate your uh, tips for uh, indicated that she's doing the right thing because she's so aggressive now controlling her blood sugar, so I'm drinking low shoe tea and tracking her blood sugar every day with Abbott Libby. Plus her dieting has really changed quite a bit, uh, really going down the low carb diet. Plus she also started doing exercise. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for putting this together because definitely education is key. Yeah. Knowledge mm -hmm. is powerful. And we have to go out there and preach the gospel of wellness. Yeah, yeah, That's absolutely. For example, the World Health Organization came out with a bulletin, and I will paraphrase. This was released many years ago, maybe seven, eight years ago, and I will paraphrase. And it says, mankind 
is slowly dying from a condition of eating too much and moving less. Yeah. Ah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. so this is a short and sweet message, and we need people like you to <laughs> carry out the gospel. Okay, so it's almost like uh, now you have the motto, you have the extra <laughs> item. Dr. Preach. Larry, but there is, I have one question that's been nagging me all this time during your presentation. Yeah. The human body needs energy, and we can only get our energy from the food we eat. Yeah. So what can we eat to make sure that we are healthy and that we are ensured a long life? a long, fruitful, and energetic life? Well, then you have to choice. You have, to, you have the choice of more selective. Selective to have food that provide you adequate energy and less toxic substance. So just like uh, uh, you can use, since I talk about cars so much, so it's just like you get the right kind of gas or gasoline. They will produce you enough power but less toxic substance, okay? Okay, which leads me to my next question. Do you support the ketogenic diet? It all depends on individual and which patient, and also what medical condition are they at their stage. If you are just preach to the wider audience or so, in assuming they don't have any particular problem medically something else yes maybe they will have less problem because when you go through the map that i have they probably produce less uh, uh, uh reactive oxygen species they probably produce less uh, like a fructose mediated pathway right. so uh we don't have time to talk into that ketogenic diet enter the so-called metabolic pathway at a different angle. So take a simple sugar, for instance. When you take sugar, you do glycolysis, which is without oxygen, okay? And then you go through pyruvate. Pyruvate is another chemical. And then through that, they enter the cycle which we call Krebs cycle. He happened to be my PhD uh, mentor at Oxford. Mm. So I understand the metabolic path well. well. And ketogenic diet uh, doesn't go through the glycolytic pathway. It right. goes somewhere in between through the pyruvate. And then maybe they will, you can say they don't burn off unnecessary energy right. because energy is through thing energy of your body but we are thinking about energy in the cell as a unit and there's a different term and that's through the what we call energy currency is atp and right. new triphosphate that's right. where how it drive the engine and with keto diet they are uh, in paper they are more efficient and they can try it much better. So you can say better mechanical coefficient, right? Like a mechanical engineer. But in some patients, if they already have some metabolic problem, if they are taking medicine for certain things, it can exacerbate or they're more susceptible to some oh. side effect. So I, I want to say it all depends. In general, yes, depends. just it's like just just like a diabetic patient depending on what stage of your diabetes you don't want them to have more sugar so you give them more protein is it good yes and no early on maybe yes but to some extent not too much mm. if you eat protein uh what happened our kidney have to do some work to uh work on the protein because protein give us some other extra energy so they give more energy to the kidney so the kidney become exactly what they call hyperfiltration so they they have to run faster oh, working uh -huh. okay. and then well but they may not have sugar there so they don't produce some of the metabolite i mentioned age uh, called advanced glycolated substance which is 
produced from sugar content. So they don't have that substance, so they won't produce it. But if the kidney function is not that good, you don't want the kidney to work that hard. Just like when your car is run for 10 years, you know that it's coming of age, but still running pretty well on regular highway. But now you are going to go to the top of the mountain, a lot of steep slope. Are you going to take that car through that? It depends. If you've gone through that before, no problem. Yes, go ahead. But if you have some hip cups before, better be careful. And in fact, there are some study also about preserving the kidney function. And we have studies showing that preserving the kidney function by eating less protein. And there's some truth in that. And they say that you can delay the uh, progression in the last time. But the price to pay is that you lack of the protein, the essential protein. So you have the other side of the coin. It's a double-edged sword. Okay, so Dr. La Larry, are you saying then that the vegetarian diet or to become a vegan is probably more supportive of of your kidney health? I think so, but they still need protein. So it depends what kind of protein they are taking. If like bean curd and other protein, yeah, they are good. And in fact, there are some chemical in the bean curd or, or the bean, a uh, soya bean, they actually lower the cholesterol. Yes. So, so there's a lot of, uh, you can say, uh, culture, history, support what people are saying. Like, uh, All right like uh, uh, some Asian diet, uh, originally a lot of vegetable based uh, diet, but because of changing of the cultures, uh, uh, people shift to the most, um, most Western uh, style diet, plus soft drink, soda, which a lot of fructose, mm -hmm. high uh, fructose uh, corn syrup. Then they added oil to the fire. And that's why that we have the silent epidemic, especially, so especially in the susceptible population. Who are the suffer because our ancestry, Asian, didn't really exposed to that before, and now they're exposed to that before. Their gene or their protective me mechanism hasn't really developed in such an extent to slow down those toxic effect good well, so thank, that's you. Right. thank you very much i think uh so vegetarian thank diet you. is actually the best <laughs> sounds like with, <laughs> with soybean <laughs> especially protein okay i know uh uh cory you need to go now right do you have to leave you can ask some more questions if you want to Corey. Yes, but i want you. to uh, but i want to comment on uh cory's mission about public education, public awareness, and if you have connection to uh, whoever the power to be, that's also even more important. What we need is to be able to change the paradigm. You need more people, you need the critical mass, number one, but you also need the power to be. What I am so honored, deeply honored to be here in this webinar with you, Dr. Chen and Andrew for putting this all together. Maybe there could be a part two, strictly Q&A from people all over the world who simply want to know more about their kidney health. At the same time, their overall optimum health with yeah. your help, Dr. Larry. Thank in you. fact, uh, uh, Corey, we are trying to do one with some of the local uh, Filipino doctors together, Larry, to get a formal, uh, not a formal, right. but a panel discussion similar to what we have and i think that would be real good i i think it started real well that's questions is mm -hmm. wonderful i think that's uh very related especially covid 19 related diabetes i think that's super super yeah well thank you again Corey. i know you have to leave but bye I'm, bye. I'm gonna send God bless you. To okay i'll, I'll take my low su tea after yeah. every meal <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry very good okay wonderful thank you okay, bye bye thank you bye bye, bye, -bye.